What happens if the Malaysian Prime Minister is incapacitated? The Malaysian Parliament is now in recess. The Prime Minister has been hospitalized because he is ill. A date for Parliament's next meeting has not been set. What happens if the Prime Minister is so ill that he is unable to perform his duties? Several sources may hold the answers. The first are constitutional provisions. The second is any act of Parliament that deals with the issue of succession. The third is any contingency plan of the Cabinet which has parliamentary approval or any decision of any ruling coalition that the executive may have drawn up. Any such thing is legally irrelevant and unenforceable. Now let's look at the first source. That is the federal constitution. There is nothing in the federal constitution that deals directly with the prime minister's succession. Apart from saying that the prime minister is someone who enjoys the confidence of a majority of the members of the Dewan Rayat in Article 43, there is no succession procedure in the constitution. Look at the chronology of events since the Pakatan Harapan government and then the Parikatan Nasional government took power. It has been nothing short of a constitutional disaster. The 14th general election ended on the 9th of May 2018. The first time parliament met after elections was on the 16th of July 2018. The last time parliament sat was on the 17th of December 2020. The king's speech was given on the 18th of May 2020, but on that day, no other parliamentary business was conducted. The PN government did this to sidestep a constitutional problem in Article 55 of the Constitution, which says, six months shall not pass between the last meeting of the last session and the first of the next. In a video entitled, is the 18th May parliamentary meeting lawful? I argued that this parliamentary meeting was unconstitutional. On the 12th of January 2021, an emergency was proclaimed on the same day. The 2021 emergency ordinance was declared by the PN government. Under these laws, which I again argued were unconstitutional, in my opinion, parliament was unconstitutionally put in suspended animation. Well, until the current government drew the umbrage of His Majesty the King. On the 29th of June 2021, His Majesty summoned the two leaders of the House. This resulted in the PN government reluctantly agreeing to summon Parliament on a vague date before the 1st of August 2021. Where does the authority to appoint a Prime Minister come from? For that, one has to look at Articles 40 and 43 of the Federal Constitution. The authority of the Prime Minister flows from the mandate given to him by the confidence of the Dewan Raya. Article 43, Clause 2, Sub Clause A says, The King shall first appoint as Prime Minister to preside over the Cabinet, a member of the House of Representatives, meaning Dewan Raya, who in his judgment is likely to command the confidence of the majority of the members of that house. But look at Article 43, Clause 4, which makes the position much clearer. Clause 4. If the Prime Minister ceases to command the confidence of the majority of the members of the House of Representatives, meaning Devan Raya, then, unless at the Prime Minister's request, the King dissolves Parliament, and the King can say no, the Prime Minister shall tender the resignation of the cabinet, exactly as Mahade did. If you read these articles together, my argument is, after a general election, but before parliament could be convened, and because the nation cannot be without a prime minister at any one time, it is open for the king to use his powers in the constitution only once, under Article 43, Clause 2, Clause A, to appoint 
a prime minister who commands the confidence of a majority of the members of the Devan Raya. Therefore, until the next election, so long as parliament is in session, the prime minister's selection is no longer in the hands of the king. On a proper construction of articles 43, clause 2a and clause 4, and constitutional law is practiced in the Commonwealth nations, that power of selection, not appointment, which is a ceremonial act of the king, passes into the hands of the members of the Devan Raya. The phrase that the PM is one who commands the confidence of the majority of the members of the House of Representatives occurs in two places in two different articles in the Federal Constitution. These are in Articles 43, Clause 4 and Article 43, Clause 2a. This repetition is crucial for the understanding that the power to select, not the power to appoint which belongs to the king, is in the hands of the MPs and the MPs only. That should be the true understanding of Articles 40 and 43 and how the Constitution should be interpreted. As you know, Article 43 reads that the cabinet shall be appointed as follows. That is to say, Clause A, the king shall first appoint as prime minister a member of the House of Representatives, Nevan Rayat, who in his judgment is likely to command the confidence of the majority of the members of that house. There is a poor argument that because Article 43, Clause 2a states that the king may act in his discretion in the appointment of a prime minister and because of the phrase who in the king's judgment is likely to command the MP's confidence in the Devan Rayat, therefore the king can appoint his own gardener as a prime minister. Such an argument subverts the true meaning and spirit of the federal constitution. In the description below, you can see a link to a video entitled Between Elections, How Many Times May His Majesty the King Appoint a Prime Minister, which explains the true position. We now move on to the third point. Does the constitution have a contingency plan for successorship? The answer is no. There are no successorship provisions in the federal constitution. Since 1957, Article 43 has remained unchanged. Number four, do any act of parliament deal with this issue? There are no acts of parliament that deal with the issue of successorship. We now deal with the several legal problems the country now faces. First, the king has never formally appointed any person as a deputy prime minister. Even if his majesty had, that is not part of the constitution and the phrase deputy prime minister never appears there. Again, the description senior minister is ultra virus, meaning outside the constitution. Second, there is no prior publicly acknowledged government agreement over how power is to be transferred to a new prime minister. Third, nor did parliament endorse any such agreement. Fourth, even if such an agreement existed, it is hardly likely that MPs in the PN government who habitually jump from one party to the other would be in a position to agree to any line of succession that does not profit them. They might jump ship again. So, until the government can show something legal, we are forced to fall back and proceed upon general principles of constitutional law to which we now turn. Historically, the Barisan National Coalition comprised several component parties based on race and religion. The United Malays National Organization or UMNO led this coalition. It used to be that that coalition had its own set of rules outside the constitution. Therefore, it was UMNO which decided who should succeed as prime minister 
if the incumbent prime minister became incapacitated. That was, of course, outside the constitution, as I mentioned. It was hardly legal unless it was endorsed by parliament. Let's look at a relevant example. On the 14th of January 1976, the then Prime Minister Tun Raza succumbed to leukemia and died in London while seeking treatment. The then Deputy Prime Minister, and they did have a Deputy Prime Minister, the well-respected Tun Hussein On was nominated by Amno to be the next Prime Minister. The next day, His Majesty the King endorsed that selection. Hussein On was therefore declared the third Prime Minister of Malaysia. Hussein On did not rely on merely the royal appointment. He put himself to the test. Eleven days after his appointment, on January the 26, 1976, Hussein On convened an emergency meeting of the Dewan Raya. There he appeared and sought a vote of confidence under Article 43. What do you think happened? He obtained it without any difficulty because Barisan National then had the numbers. Now, Tan Sri Mohidin was appointed as the 8th Prime Minister on the 1st of March 2020. He took no steps as did Hussein On. He did not seek a vote of confidence in Parliament. This continues to haunt his government. The budget was passed by one of the narrowest ever votes in the history of Malaysia. 111 members, exactly one half of the Dewan Rakyat, voted to pass the budget. 108 MPs opposed it. Tanku Razali Hamza, an MP, was absent. Two other MPs had died. When I argued that the PM clearly did not enjoy the support of most members of the Dewan Rakyat on that day, an argument based on Article 62, Clause 3 of the Constitution was raised against me. Now, Article 62, Clause 3 states that all decisions of Parliament are to be taken by a simple majority of members voting. Now, this argument is wholly inaccurate in establishing the strength of the support of the Prime Minister. Let's test it. Understanding Order 13 of the Dewan Raya, a proper quorum to conduct any business is when 26 MPs are present, excluding the Speaker. Suppose only 40 MPs out of a total of 222 MPs had attended the 2020 budget debate, and suppose 39 voted in favour of the budget and one voted against. Suppose the rest of the House comprised in 182 MPs, or 89% of the Dewan Rakyat were absent from the chambers. They were having tea at the canteen. Despite the absence of 81% of the Dewan Rakyat, could it be argued that the bill had been successful? Perhaps. Second, could it have been said that on the budget day, the Prime Minister enjoyed the confidence of most of the members of the Day One Riot? I think the answer is obvious. In dealing with constitutional interpretation, one must aspire to uphold the rule of law and not raise pedantic arguments or any literal interpretation of the constitution. Such pedantic interpretation violates the spirit of the law. That would not only be improper, it would be constitutionally wrong. It would lead to dangerous precedents, the result of all of which we are experiencing since the 1st of March 2019. We now come to the third option that could possibly be exercised. Some MPs have always voted according to their party's instructions as opposed to their oaths of allegiance. I have previously argued, and I'll give you details in the description, that MPs are fiduciaries, meaning trustees of the entire nation. There is a federal court opinion later approved by a series of cases. I think it was the government of Malaysia versus Lim Kit Siang in the year 1988, that an MP does not only represent 
his electoral constituency. He or she represents the interests of the entire nation. Where an MP votes on any resolution before the day one riot, or a member of the Senate in the Senate. The only question he or she must have in her mind is whether if I cast my vote in the way I desire, will it benefit the nation? If the answer is no, no matter what the MP's party instructs, if an MP votes against his oath of allegiance on the day he took office, he prejudices the best interest of the nation and he breaches two laws. The first is the constitutional oath in Article 59 read with the sixth schedule to the federal constitution. Do you know what an MP swears to? The oath of a member of the House of Representatives, Devon Rayat, or the Senate reads, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully, one, discharge my duties as such to the best of my ability, and two, I will bear true faith and allegiance to who? Malaysia. And three, I will preserve, protect and defend its constitution. If an MP were to vote to elect a prime minister in accordance with his party's wishes and instructions, then he is not faithfully discharging his duties to the best of his ability. Second, he does not bear true faith and allegiance to Malaysia. Third, he does not preserve, protect and defend the Malaysian constitution. So any attempt by a coalition of parties to influence the selection of a prime minister based on a party's or a coalition of parties' selfish motivation would be absolutely unconstitutional. Any citizen could sue all of these MPs or the coalition parties in the civil courts for breaching the oath of office. Some people already have, as you would have heard. What about the fourth choice? What if His Majesty the King chooses the candidate himself? There has been a suggestion that perhaps that His Majesty the King may interview members of parliament to determine who shall be the PM. I think this misses a crucial constitutional point. I spoke about this a little earlier, remember? On the relationship between Articles 40 and 43 and the poor argument that was raised earlier. If the PM is incapacitated while Parliament is in session, the only persons who can choose the Prime Minister are the MPs, the Rajats, representatives. Since 32 million people cannot come together in one place to choose the nation's leader, it's not only constitutional, but logical for the Rakyat's respective representatives, you know, the MPs in the Devon riot, to do that. That would be in keeping with the genuine spirit of Article 43 and Article 40, Clause 4. If His Majesty the King, with the very best of intentions, takes these exclusively parliamentary duties upon himself, whether parliament is in session or is in recess, and if His Majesty conducts an interview, that is a mechanism with the greatest respect not provided for in the constitution. With respect to His Majesty the King, that might cause controversy However, I'm happy to say this is not likely as the king has made it very clear that he will abide by the constitution and that is excellent. In conclusion, any transfer of power from one prime minister to another depends on the mandate flowing from the floor of the day one riot. If such an exigency presents itself, I hope His Majesty as His Majesty has already correctly and constitutionally directed last week, His Majesty should direct the Speaker of Parliament to call an immediate sitting, a special sitting of the Devon Riot, so that the MPs in Devon Riot can choose the one person who commands their confidence. Meanwhile, I do hope Prime Minister Maidin recovers from his bout of dyspepsia and returns to his duties promptly.
And these are only my views. I was wondering what if we could choose a lady as the Prime Minister of Malaysia. That would be wonderful, isn't it? Thank you for watching. Subscribe, like, comment and share widely. Good night.